Good evening and welcome back to Vegas October 1 Sounds. Tonight I'd just like to chat a little bit and chat about, about gunshot acoustics and uh, discuss the overall concept, a little bit about the theory, and make some observations that are probably necessary at this point in time. So let's talk about sound first of all. What is sound? Well, sound, like many things in life, can best be understood as a pressure. And nature likes to equalize out pressures. So wherever there's a high pressure and a low pressure, then the molecules uh, of whatever the medium is, which for us sound air, uh, it tends to go from the high pressure to the low pressure. Now, of course, you have to take into account that every molecule has momentum and wants to stay in motion unless, according to Newton, it's acted upon by an external force. Now, you notice specifically that I have not mentioned waves because waves bring up this connotation of these little rolling hills when, in fact, sound is not a rolling hill at all. It's a... Uh, oscillating pressure against the eardrum or if, if it doesn't impact the eardrum it's oscillating pressure of molecules so that while the molecules themselves don't move great distances individually they get closer together in places and further apart in others and uh, they pass along that if they're under high pressure and hence close together they pass along that pressure to the next molecule and so the sound moving through the medium kind of propagates uh, a distance. The molecules don't move very far, but the sound does. So a pressure. And a lot of things, including electrical engineering at the very basic theory, can be understood as pressure and pressure gradients and fields, but most easily as pressure. So when we think of sound we have to think in terms of pressure but yet when we do all these uh, calculations and assertions and everything we tend to treat things as either a wave or a ray because in sound the propagation of the energy through the medium which is air is best reserved for a direct path or the shortest distance that is the greatest energy received will always be the direct path that has no obstructions and that brings us to the concept of obstructions we haven't talked much about obstructions a little bit you know about how sound can bend around items um, but we haven't talked about walls and what we can hear on one side of the wall or the other we haven't talked about the relationship of the source of the sound relative to objects and yet as we all know in Vegas the whole area is dominated by objects and I, th I remember the one statement that struck me early on probably being made in the first week or two someone came along and said that you will never understand what truly happened in Vegas with regards to the acoustics unless you run a 3D simulation that's very accurate. And I think that I completely agree with that. Because even with all the knowledge and time and calculations and explanations and theories and models and, and, and recordings under, under my belt, I still have not presented um, the entire complexity of the whole situation. And there truly are very, very, very complex interactions of these sounds going on that are beyond the comprehension of anybody that I know and have ever met. And that's neither an arrogant statement nor a statement of humbleness. It's just a statement of our ability to understand, predict, and project things that are involve so many pe moving pieces uh, that it's 
not intuitive to our brains. And that brings me to an interesting observation. People, including myself, tend to like simple explanations, even when the simplest explanation is not the correct one. And engineers, in particular, love to uh, restrict the environment in such a way that objects behave in a well-defined pattern or respond in ways that is well-defined to well-defined input. And so we come up with these simplifications of, of what's really going on. And that's pretty much you know, a, a strong statement of, of what people can know, what they do know, and what is even possible for them to know. And why does this make any why is this relevant? What does it have to do with what we're doing in Vegas? Well, I've just admitted that fundamentally I cannot explain to you all the complexities of gunshot acoustics. And so when anyone asks me, well, what is this? Can you explain this, Richard? I have to do it in terms of simple approximations. One, because that's what the person or people love to hear. Two, because it's the easiest thing. And three, oftentimes it's enough to get to the next point in the um, analysis or investigation or observation. But if you have a recording of sound, it's not really a recording of one sound, it's a recording of, you know, bazillions amounts of sounds all interacting to form uh, a pressure on the recording device. And it's not theoretically possible to take that recording and then work backwards t and decipher exactly what created the summation of all those uh, forces because it's a non-unique solution just as I say, well, I recorded the number three. That's great. But that could have been the sum of one and four, or the difference of eight and five, or the product of one and three, or any number of irrational numbers put together. So you see that given a, pr a result, it's not always possible to say what the input and the uh, method was for uh, combining those inputs. And that's true with gunshot acoustics and acoustics in general. If you hear a sound, that does not mean that you can know or predict with 100% certainty what was the cause of that sound. And so all the time we have to deal with the context and the probability of what happened. And this is very relevant when you're talking about those things that we call the supersonic cracks. The sounds produced by a supersonic projectile traveling through the air and creating shock waves which con which it produces them, you know, almost continuously, and then all those little shock waves get together and form a cone along the path of the projectile. And it's our encounter with that cone is what is heard or recorded. Um, and so that sound has, that, that phenomena interacting with our ears or our recordings has a unique, a fairly distinctive sound, but there are dozens of other phenomena that can produce a very, very similar sound. And so a, a small rock hitting the windshield, maybe a small explosion, or something hitting the inside of a building, or an object hitting the outside of the building, or, or you know, God knows, you know, all the different types of things that can produce a sound, which is close enough to a real gunshot sound to be in, almost indistinguishable, particularly at great distances, because sounds over distance tend to change their frequency and they most definitely change their amplitude. 
So what was once a very high-pitched shrill sound over a couple thousand feet may actually start to sound like a, a small drum that's hit very softly at, at a far distance. Because <coughs> the air, as the sound propagates through those molecules, absorbs some of the energy and spreads the waves or spreads the sound out to all, evens out the pressure, shall we say. So the waves tend to get longer in wavelength and smaller in amplitude. And particularly at large distances, it's very, very difficult to tell what's going on. But even when you're up close, uh, if somebody says, I heard a supersonic crack, you can say, that's great, but how do you know that that's a supersonic crack? Well, I just know because of my experience. At which point you have to stop and say, hey, you're not being truthful with yourself and you're not being truthful with me. And so that's why I go to great lengths in my analysis to um, take these sounds, particularly these s single anomalies, and try to observe from multiple attitudes or biases or angles the same sound to demonstrate that it is what I believe it is. And so we get to the point where, well at least it seems like it to me now, that everybody's looking for the magic sound that will demonstrate that either the the quote-unquote narrative is wrong or that we have a sniper or that some other phenomenon has happened and it, it seems as though in the ze zeal to to make that discovery a lot of uh, common sense has been abandoned for example when you hear something that sounds like a supersonic crack in the middle of of a known volley I think it's more probable that the sound you hear is associated with that volley than it is likely to be another sound produced by another source or another gun and overlapped with the volley. And there's a lot of that going around and I think we're all guilty of it to some extent. But in that situation I believe that the burden of proof is on the person making the, the assertion that this is a un new and unique sound because in my experience with Vegas the types of sounds that can be produced from one bullet are so vast and varied particularly if you're changing your your attitude or your location or distance to the the source of the bullet or the sor and or the source of, of the gun um, that it's wildly irresponsible to say that if the sound is different you have something new and unique and so um, I need to explain a few more things and to bring to your attention phenomena which I've yet to explain that can perhaps open up people's eyes because not every volley has with it for every shot a supersonic crack and a muzzle because when a bullet, for example, when a bullet hits the ground, it stops producing the shock waves. And if you're on the opposite side of a wall from that phenomena, then you're unlikely to, one, hear the impact of the bullet, and two, you're unlikely to hear half the shock waves because half the shock waves are headed towards the ground, typically and the other half is is headed up in the air away from your location so under those circumstances, and I'll draw a picture here in a minute, under those circumstances then the volley that gets recorded at your location would be void of the supersonic cracks or if they're there they'd be extremely low in intensity particularly since uh, supersonic cracks tend to be on the higher end of the frequency spectrum of hearing. Similarly, uh, if we have a, a volley that contains uh, some 
muzzle blast and some supersonic cracks but not consistent throughout and it's a good recording environment meaning that it's not overwhelmed with uh, background noise there's still very reasonable and logical explanations for what is happening um, but anyway let's not make it too complex let's get back to what happens with um, a shot and, and let's just presume that it's an elevated shot because uh, without it being elevated well let's well let's start with one that's at the ground level let's say we have um, what do I want here I want to put some dirt down and you know of course these are all simplifications of what's really going on because the real deal is a, a three-dimensional phenomena and I can't with my hand here magically draw a 3D thing or if I did it look so terrible as to be not representative of what is actually happening. So we got the ground and let's say we're on the ground somewhere and we have a, a rifle and it fires a supersonic projectile along a path looking like this and let's just assume you know that it's constant speed it's not really but and uh, if we understand anything about gunshot acoustics we know that that projectile is cons constantly producing waves along here but at any given point you can and forming a cone and from a side view that cone might look something like this for a, a Mach 2 type bullet but you'll observe one thing namely that that wave front on this side of the cone at the ground is headed towards the ground and so at some point it hits that ground and it may reflect or be absorbed or do any number of other things and if there's objects in the way it may you know reflect off them and be blocked by them but if we have a wall and just ignore the fact that the bullet is going to hit the wall for the moment here then um, even if the bullet makes it all the way out close to the wall we're still going to have a lot of the shock wave which is you know traveling this way uh, hit the ground and or hit the wall and when it hits the ground it's going to be reflected back up at an equal angle and some of it will hit the wall and some of it will go over the wall in a direction that heads towards the sky and on the other side of, of the the uh, uh, projectile we have these uh, shock cones that are headed out into space essentially and so we're not likely to record that now looking from a different perspective on this that whole phenomena if we looked at it straight down the line of the bullet would kinda look like um, concentric circles because it's a cone and when you slice a cone perpendicular to its axis of origin you get concentric circles so if the bullet were coming directly at us uh, then th you could look at that and say well then you know parts of that shock wave be going being created you know is going in lots of different directions and that would be true some are going you know this way or it just you know it's just going all along that place so you can see it's not just a simple single one angle cone but all over and so from this perspective if the wall were right in front of us we'd have to observe that there would be a great many of those waves that are still headed towards the ground and a great many of the waves are headed off in another direction not even towards us and a great many headed off into space but with a the wall there uh, most of the ones that are coming towards the wall would be reflected back away and if our recording location were on the other side of the wall and the wall was any height at all then those shock waves being high frequency are going to be entirely blocked and we're going to end up in a dead zone where we don't hear any of the uh, shock waves or if the wall happens to be shorter 
then we would hear some of them just depends upon our location and not others so that's an example of the complexity of those supersonic cracks that it has to be accounted for when you're um, thinking about whether or not the sound you heard is related to the thing that's going on at that time or whether it's a unique sound. The muzzle blasts are a little simpler and they're simpler in the fact that they aren't creating a cone, they create a, a, a sphere and if that and that sphere starts right at the barrel here and then it spreads out concentrically and the sphere just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and because they're lower frequency when they end up hitting the wall they actually kind of bend around it and make it down into our recording device or ears and that's because they're much lower frequency and that's all governed by you know if if the wavelength and now we have to talk about wavelength so if we have a um, one kilohertz or, uh, frequency wave of sound then one over that is its wavelength in terms of time one over a thousand or a thousandth of a second or zero point oh oh one in time and then define that in terms of actual feet or distance we'd have to multiply it by the speed of sound so for a speed of sound of eleven hundred feet per second which is approximately the speed of sound that evening so we'd end up with a wavelength of eleven hundred times point oh oh one or 1.1 feet and a 1.1 foot wave can easily bend around a six inch pole or start to bend around the corners of a wall whereas a um, 3 kilohertz signal 3000 hertz would have one third that which would be about what 0.4 a little less than 0.4 so it could not easily, 0.4 feet, it could not easily bend around uh, half a foot. It would be, tend to be blocked. And so the wavelength matters. And so muzzle blasts being down in the 500 um, hertz range are going to easily bend around, say, a, a pole, small pole, going to bend around and just go right through a fence or a lattice work uh, other things like that whereas the higher pitch supersonic cracks are going to have trouble doing those things and they're going to reach you either by reflection or some other mechanism an indirect path we call it so the characteristics of the two sounds and the physics of them have a great deal to do with what gets recorded particularly when you in uh, consider the wall objects like walls or the bullet hitting something because once the bullet hits the ground uh, and let's do this hits the ground it may have been producing a cone along the way but once it hits that stops now if this were the true angle of the cone at the time the bullet stopped it would continue to propagate out that way and you see that us being on the other side of the wall would never receive any from that and this portion would go down to the ground and get reflected and head back out that way uh, most likely and we'd probably never receive much of that at all if the wall were not there then we'd probably receive whatever this wave was like when it reached out there but remember it's not producing more so this oops this wave wave the sound is kinda limited in terms of how it propagates along and since no more waves are going to be produced it kinda starts to shrink on this lower end and form you know a spherical pattern <coughs> 
of much lower amplitude and that's the key is that it ends up creating this uh, area here that is kind of dead and so in fact it, it may reach us that dead zone may reach us and not the real high intensity of shock wave so when bullets hit the ground you know things that are directly along the path of the bullet at a distance tend to not have uh, any um, tend not to have much of a recording of the supersonic crack but to know that you have to know where your recording is the path of the bullet uh, the intensity of the wave ie the Mach angle and it not only the intensity but the angle you have to know this angle of there so you have to make a lot of calculations and a lot of assumptions and so when you hear that if you hear that supersonic crack all those things come into play and it's not just a simple a I heard a crack and therefore there's another bullet or there's not a bullet or blah 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 a lot of complications involved so what do we do then I mean because most people don't have the time, interest, or ability uh, to use the tools that professional uh, audio engineers use. And so we end up with these simple observations of I heard something and I believe it to be something. And that's pretty much where the argument ends up. And then people like myself come along and say, well, wait a minute, how do you know what you heard? Well, it sounds like one. That's great. I agree. It sounds like it. It looks like it. But how do we know it is that? And so then you go into this long discourse of, well, you know, is it recorded on multiple videos? Because if it is, then it's it's a sound that's not local to the to one recording. If it's recorded on multiple videos, what do the waveforms look like? You know, it does it show a consistent pattern of being strong in one area and weak in the other? Does it show a consistent pattern of correlating to a reflection? Does it show a consistent p pattern of getting stronger the closer it gets to some point? You know, all these factors come into play and you have to end up making multiple observations before you can reach any conclusion about that what that sound really is. And so for me, it takes dozens of hours when I have just one sound, regardless of whether it's in amongst other sounds or in amongst a volley, it takes dozens of hours, oftentimes, you know, on the order of 40 hours for me to, to do a rigorous analysis of that one sound, simply because it's one. Now, with volleys, where there's say a hundred shots in each, I can quickly set count up the number of muzzle blasts, the number of of uh, supersonic cracks if they're there, or if the volley, if the muzzles are there, and I can measure the the time between all those things. I can measure the duration, and then I can compare that to two or three other videos and quickly come up with a high probability assertion of what was going on, but not so with these. Uh, simple observations of uh, one sound or maybe two sounds or even up to four sounds. Past four sounds you start to get a good idea of what's going on much more quickly. And so that's the Achilles heel of gunshot acoustics, particularly if you're doing it in a forensic setting, is that the fewer shots you have in a particular location the lower the probability of you being able to make a realistic statement on what's happening. But yet all the time I hear people saying, oh, that proves there's a sniper because here's a supersonic round, that one supersonic round inside uh, a volley consisting of mostly muzzle sounds. Well, to me that's, you know, a situation that requires a considerable effort to say yay or nay. So, um, you know, I think it's caveat emptor, <laughs> so to speak, when, when people put that out and other people uh, 
want to believe it. And that's pretty much what's going on these days in Vegas. People wanting to believe something, but not taking the time uh, to do a proper... Mm, anal not analysis, but proper uh, vetting of the information that's being provided. And as I have explained in, in now approaching a hundred videos, uh, a lot of the techniques being used out there are very, very subjective and susceptible to error. Alright, so, so let's talk about a few other things that I just find entirely fascinating about gunshot acoustics that you would not first think were possible. And why am I doing this? Because it demonstrates that simple beliefs, while perhaps lucky and, and perhaps being true in some cases, are not always going to work. So let's take the case of a projectile, and just for our purposes, it's go let's presume it's going to travel in a constant velocity because that's going to make our calculations easier. And we have multiple observers. At some distance down here, let's say a thousand feet, we have an observer or a recorder that's very, very close to the path of the bullet. And let's call that a thousand feet out. And this is a, a supersonic projectile. And then we have another observer somewhere over here, let's say uh, 750 feet. So, now comes the questions. And if we assume that the, a shot is fired here, and we also assume that the speed of sound, which I often designate as C naught, equals 1,000 feet per second, we can start asking and answering some questions. Now in this case, we can ask, when will the people hear one the muzzle blast. Well that's easy because it's just the distance divided by the speed of sound and and in this case I've already you know kind of flattened out the whole diagram because I said it's 750 feet regardless of whether it's in the air on the ground or whatnot between the muzzle of the gun and this point over there. So in that case we'd have a calculation of of 750 feet divided by a thousand feet per second and we'd end up with uh, the muzzle blast arriving at this observer A at 0 0.75 seconds after the gun fired the round. And similarly down here you'd end up with a thousand over a thousand which would be one second. So, in this case, and this is observer B, observer A would hear the sound at 0.25 seconds prior to when observer B did. So, that's simple enough, right? Alright, so we can erase that. Or at least the calculations for the muzzle blast. We can leave the distances, leave the, the speed of sound, although in this case it's not going to be very relevant, and add in the bullet. Let's assume the bullet is traveling at Mach 3. So the, vo oops. the velocity of the bullet equals 3,000 feet per second. Now some of you who are longtime listeners will quickly understand what I'm going to do here. So if the bullet is traveling along the yellow path at 3,000 feet per second and it only takes, and it's 1,000 feet to travel, then when the bullet gets here, we've only consumed, consumed one-third of a second. Okay, and then this, and then the, the crack will be generated approximately there and I have to propagate this small distance 
to observer B, which we'll call zero. And so we will hear at observer B the supersonic crack for that projectile at one third of a second after the bullet was fired. However, up here, that's a whole different scenario. Uh, this will hear a supersonic crack somewhere very close to the tip of the gun from the tip of a gun so the so the bullet will come out travel a small distance and then that supersonic crack that was generated there will propagate out to position A at the speed of sound so essentially at A we will hear the crack at again just like the muzzle 750 divided by 1000 or point seven five seconds after the bullet was fired. Oh, well now. That's kind of strange, isn't it? The guy who was closest records the supersonic crack a long time, long time being real, after the guy at B records the crack who is much further out. Now get that through your mind a little bit that the order in which observers A and B record the supersonic crack is not directly proportional to the distance between the gun and the observers. And in fact, in this particular scenario, the person further away records the, the crack much, much earlier. And this is, you know, um, when I say that the the supersonic cracks do not preserve the order of the bullets is one of the things that I'm referring to. Um, similarly, this same phenomena could be turned on its head if we have two bullets fired. Now this was just one bullet. So let's take this whole scenario and turn it on its head. And we're going to fire two bullets this time. So we've got two bullets. One is going to go this way. Oops. One is going to go that way. And the other is going to go, well, that's a piss poor line. And it's going to go this way. So this is bullet two. This is bullet one. Okay. Now, we put some observers on this map. And I'm going to uh, place these very judiciously, of course. There's the gun. And, well, let's stick up here with A at the roughly the same location. We'll say 750 foot away from the gun. And then over here we can um, where do we want to put this to make this be a good example? Oh, let's put it in here. All right. And let's say that that is, uh, what did I say before? That's also so. Let's also call that about uh, 900 feet along the yellow path. But we have to do this in terms of downrange distance and cross range. So that's the dividing line there. So now we go about calculating the, the supersonic crack arrival time.
Well, as we explained before, since this position A, this position A will receive a supersonic crack that propagates along this path at the speed of sound, and very soon after the bullet is fired is where it will be generated. And so we're going to stick with 0 0.75 for the supersonic crack, f and that will apply to both bullet, well, uh, when will it apply to? It'll apply to bullet 2 for certainly, because it's a big angle there. But in this case for bullet 1, so this is for equal bullet 2's when the uh, supersonic crack will arrive, approximately. For bullet number 1, what we'll have is a slightly different scenario because the angle between the observer and the bullet path has shortened then it will arrive uh, the bullet will the uh, supersonic crack will be generated probably about here and then propagate that way which is a much much shorter distance so it's going to go along this route at Mach 2 3 so let's call that um, 250 feet at Mach 3, so that would be um, 250, well we better do it somewhere else, that'd be 250 feet over Mach 3, over 3,000, and then it has to come along this distance and travel another oh, 500 feet at Mach 3 and so that's going to be equal to in this case 1 over 6 oh well I was wrong there take that back take that back here the 500 feet does not travel at the speed of the bullet it travels at the speed of sound so that's um, at 1,000. So that one's easy. That's the speed of sound. So that number turns out to be a half a second. There. And this one turns out to be 25 over 300, which is 1 over 12. And that will equal 0.5 plus um, point oh eight, let's say. So the supersonic shock wave for bullet number one at location A is going to arrive at point five eight. Okay. So this is the number for bullet one. and this is the number for bullet two. Now you'll notice something rather curious here, won't you? In that the supersonic crack for bullet two arrive I mean bullet one arrives no that's about right, one follows followed by two. Okay. Now let's go down to this one over here. And uh, we have to kind of estimate this distance <coughs> and this distance. Well, we said this distance was 900 feet. Okay. So for bullet one, because that angle is large, essentially we're going to create the shock down here just like we did up there. So for the first bullet, the arrival of the shock wave is going to be 900 over the speed of sound. which is approximately 0.9. For the second case, for bullet number two, the angle is much, much smaller, and we the bullet's going to travel along the red line to a point which is probably about here, which is probably going to be, let's say, three or four hundred. Let's call it 300 feet. 
and then this distance is probably going to be about 400 feet so we're going to get 300 over 3k plus 400 over 1k which is going to be um, 1 over 10 plus uh, a point 0.4 which is equal to point 0.5 okay so the supersonic crack for bullet number two at observer B is point 0.5 All right so now how does that compare bullet number two here in this case bullet number two the shock wave, the supersonic shock wave, arrived prior to A. So it has just reversed order of arrival as compared to the bullets. And while these numbers are sloppy, this is in fact a real situation. That is, a supersonic crack for one bullet may arrive before a bullet prior and this is one of the strange things and this all depends upon where the bullets went and where the observers are so you have to be careful now this is a situation which occurs very rarely because the changing of path of this distance between rounds is rather unusual and difficult to achieve particularly with a handheld rifle but half that distance is occurs quite frequently and uh, volley seven is a very good example the one where where it always sounds like talking guns because that is sweeping such a large distance over a quick time that the arrival times change in a way that cause this floating pattern of supersonic cracks uh, to appear amongst the muzzle blast and for most of the volleys rec uh, recordings in the venue you get this thing that sounds like muzzle blast and then another gun firing on top of it but in fact it is exactly something like this scenario alright so that was kind of a complicated one didn't really mean to get into that too much alright so We've talked a little bit about um, walls. We've talked a little bit about, you know, the, the complexities of the supersonic crack. Um, when would we not hear muzzle blasts? Since we have already determined that the muzzle sounds, while being lower in frequency, uh, tend to bend around objects better, okay, than the supersonic cracks. So is it the case that we would hear a supersonic crack and not a corresponding muzzle? Well, if the gun was silenced, that might be the case. But that's a, a level of complexity that lowers the probability of the observation being valid. So, um, if we have a, 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 a bullet that travels a long time, you know, eventually takes a dirt nap. And let's say this is 3,000 feet. At that distance, even with a direct line of sight, the muzzle blast is kind of getting soft. That is, it reduces intensity. But if you had an observer that was really close to the, the path of that bullet at that distance, the crack would still be very, very loud because this, it's generated along the path and here at this observing distance it's going to be loud so you have an extremely loud crack and a substantially reduced muzzle even if you have clear line of sight and the ratio of those two volume volumes may be so great that the muzzle blast is entirely consumed in either the sound of the supersonic crack echoing off and or the uh, background sound. Now remember, phones, 
have a fixed dynamic range and to accommodate l ranges larger than that they have to adjust the gain so when it hears this crack if it doesn't you know adjust the gain retroactively then you're going to get a signal which is clipped by the limited and fixed dynamic range of the microphone so when this loud sound is heard the signal processing unit adjusts the gain to fit within the limited bandwidth of the recording device and because of that this smaller um, muzzle wave is reduced even further and the phone will probably keep that um, gain for a while until it determines that no more loud noises are coming along so it's a problematic, situa problematic situation if at 3,000 feet, it may be the case that the, the phone, probably it, it is likely the case that the phone hears this loud sound, adjusts it to fit on the um, recording device, and then uh, not hearing anything for, well, let's see, 3,000 feet would take nearly three seconds at the speed of sound. So then the supersonic shock would, would be heard, it would be big and loud and prominent, and then three seconds later, uh, you'd get this little uh, wave and since three seconds had elapsed the phone probably would have turned the gain back up but that would be entirely dependent upon the other sounds that were happening at the time if nobody was talking and it was quiet and far removed from the din of the venue like uh, Oasis is then you'd probably record that extra muzzle blast but if it's in amongst people talking and everything then the, this little wave is probably going to be lost. So in that scenario you you could have the situation where you get strictly a supersonic crack with potentially um, no observable recording of the muzzle blast. So you just have to keep these dynamics in mind that it's not always the case that you have both a supersonic crack and a muzzle and in fact you can have the other way around you, you can have one of each or neither and so when we make observations about oh we heard this l large crack and it must be something new and unique we have to be very careful and take into consideration all these things now that's not to say that the observation isn't correct or won't prove to prove out to be correct but at just the observation level it's just an observation of something that me needs to be looked at and uh, 10 minutes of observation isn't going to cut it for, it for for these single events, so to speak. All right, what else would I like to talk about? Um, well, I think, I, let me check the time. I think I've probably gone on a, enough tonight. I just wanted to cover a few things. And, uh, yeah, that's enough for tonight. Uh, we'll grab you in the next one and we'll cover some other subjects and, and do an analysis of, uh, uh, of some real situations where I'll show you uh, what's happening. Oh, and before I go, though, Vegas. Yeah, I wanted to get into Vegas. Vegas. Vegas in the venue has a wall around it with gates. It's got massive buildings everywhere on all sides of this venue. You've got some low buildings over here. It's got dirt there. You know, inside the venue, it's got tents. It's got buildings. It's got chairs. It's got more buildings over here. It's got the stage. Now, any sound being generated at any location is going to have to face these things. And these things will cause reflections, absorptions, and refraction. You know, these little poles will cause refractions. The chain link fence will cause refractions sometimes. The uh, smaller buildings' corners will cause refractions. Um, and sounds do weird things because you can have two sounds come in that are faint. Uh, let's, let's take a... Anyway, there's going to be a tremendous number of 
uh, reflective surfaces that confuse the heck out of everything. And so between these prominent rounds of loud gunshot sounds, you would expect to see lots and lots of echoes that do overlapping and they cancel out each other or overlapping and they enhance each other or they arrive slightly different time creating an echo effect or sounding like you know multiple guns but at a reduced level we've measured I've measured multiple multiple even for one recording location up to a dozen different forms of echo for that location and uh, particularly notorious are the areas over here and then out over here near the church and I haven't quite figured out why near the church but you know I don't know if it's coming from the Mandalay Bay hitting the Tropic Cannon coming in or something off the Luxor or something off something in here and coming out but there's lots and lots of reflection in those areas inside the venue you normally get uh, a din of chaos of people talking and so you can't even really make out reflections you're lucky to make out the primary signals of the gunshots but when you start getting um, into these regions out there and way down here and over there well let's talk about this region let's talk about this a little bit these regions you're far enough away from the shooting and I'm gonna say over it's coming from over there that the muzzle blast and the supersonic cracks even when they're pretty much aligned along there are starting to do pretty strange things you're starting to get massive dropout from the supersonic cracks um, sometimes the muzzles will be confused and then when you hop over the the wall surrounding the venue on this other side uh, that seems to clear things up a little bit in terms of the quality of the signal but it also uh, still has dropouts in supersonic cracks for areas near and above the church uh, but this way they seem seem all to be pretty clear probably because there's fewer buildings that way over here between the walls along the boulevard all hell breaks loose because normally you get multiple reflections between these walls and it ends up looking pretty chaotic when you're in the middle of the street or on the street there's the sounds are pretty good uh, as you come along through this parking lot over here in the Luxor the sounds are real good uh, then as you reach this region that is right around the Mandalay Bay uh, there's lots and lots of surfaces and lots and lots of echoes and because it is close the uh, recordings tend to have a small lag and so it's very difficult or it's often difficult to separate out uh, the supersonic crack from the muzzle but it almost always are there in this region you tend to lose supersonic cracks in this region up here you tend to lose supersonic cracks and lose supersonic cracks there but further out you get get some out here where it's quieter over here you get some but being far distances both of these lines uh, if people are talking then you tend to lose the signal period um, down here at the oasis area there's not too much talking so you almost always get good recordings and anywhere along that path you tend to get good recordings provided the 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 act of walking that people do in the recording are quiet um, well, that's that's a good indication. So there's always different ways of looking at things in gunshot acoustics, and at the it's not always as I explained earlier. It's not always the case that there is a unique solution. Just like I said, you know, if you observe the number three on your recording device, that could have been created by adding one and four or subtracting eight and five. I mean, excuse me, adding one and two or subtracting eight and five. So, anyway, that's it. Uh, we'll grab you in the next one.